All right, man. We are live. We are live. Hey, Cody. What's going on, brother? Good to be here. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. If you're coming on right now, it's that time of the week. It is that time. Look at that. Old Steady Eddie, my man. <laughs> Let's go. I love Eddie Frazier. Great attitude, hard worker. He's a good dude. Amazing. Amazing. I've seen him consistently every week. So, Eddie, shout out, brother. We love you. Uh, Maria, got some claps out here. Uh, we got Kingston in here. We're starting to see some people join in. I'm excited, guys. Check in, guys. Uh, Tell us where you're from. Tell us where you're from. Please do. Please do. Tashiana, just one of my favorite individuals out there. Tashiana King. How you doing, girl? Um, she's doing big things also with her wholesaling business. Uh, Nathan, house, house flipping. flipping. Yeah, Awesome, guys. Let us know where you're from. Like Jerry said, please put in the comment. We've got uh, a visitor right here from South Florida. We got Pasadena, Texas. Uh, Worcester, is that Maryland? Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I yard. Well, you're going to be just watching on whatever platform, Kashian. So right now it shows you in Facebook. So you're already with us. You're with us live. But if you want to stream yard, you just have to get a stream yard account. Then you can put it on multiple platforms all at once. Um, all right, so Illinois, Indiana, Charleston, Orlando, Philly. Guys, I love it. We're coming from all over the place. Let's uh, let's kind of hop into some of this fun stuff. Uh, before we get going, let's do some catch up. How are things going for real estate in the real estate world for you, Jerry? What's new? Get us caught up to speed. Oh, just... I mean, as, as tight as the market is, it's just been amazing. Like my deals right now that we're putting out for sale over asking price, phenomenal. That's fun. Uh, about to close on one of my great big monster deals, $5 million sale price. We uh, Our contract said uh, one week from CFO and we got the CFO today. So here we go, baby. Should close in like a week. Um, what else is going on? Just about to put, uh, well, put it under contract, a sub two deal, which is kind of fun. In uh, down in Tucson's where this house is, so okay. 300,000 $300, back end and a 128 buy, 56 56 sub two carry. So coming out of pocket about 78 cash, 56, and I think I'm gonna sub tail this deal. So I'm just gonna relist it uh, for like 299.9. Not so, bad. bad. Yeah, pretty sick. Look at this one here. What's that? Future millionaire right here. Oh yeah, Joe, you do it, baby. Uh, so that's, I've never heard of sub tell. You're going to have to yeah. really break that down. Cause I think even right now I'm like, wait a second, what the heck sub tell? Yeah. Pace Morby called it that. So it's basically a subject to acquisition, but then the exit is going to be just, just list it like we do whole tail. Right. So, so I'm going to take it down and then just relist is all. Yeah. Love it. Love it. Look at, we've got some great individuals made their first call to two agents today. Nice. Keep going. Keep going. Those are the small actions that make all the difference. I have to say that again. Those are the small actions that make all the difference. The ones that swing in the bat the most is the one that has the likelihood of hitting the ball. So you got to make sure you're swinging that bat, swinging that bat. It's crucial, crucial. So keep going. Turn that two into a hundred. Turn the hundred into a thousand. Turn the thousand into ten thousand, and you'll start to see that those are the actions that separate the ones that are doing deals and not doing deals. Yep, love that. Um, amazing people from all over the place. I love this. Um, well, let's rock and roll. Let's get going. Um, what are we going to be talking about, Jerry? What's going to get this this crew? on board to help them understand what are we breaking down tonight so they know why they need to have, like I always say, a notepad and a pen to jot down some gold nuggets that are going to be shared throughout this evening. That's really going to help them. But I think it's also going to give them an understanding of two different views tonight. Yeah, we decided not to bring on a live guest um, so that we could have a little bit more time to dedicate to this topic and also to the Q&A. So I uh, hope you guys appreciate that. But 
like Cody said, we're going to bring you two completely different perspectives on acquisitions, specifically closing your contracts. And so what we wanted to do is want to talk about uh, the difference between going on appointment live in person, doesn't necessarily have to be you, but your acquisitions manager, going on appointment live, closing that sale with the seller at the kitchen table, that model versus, versus totally virtual, or I guess it doesn't have to be virtual, but really closing, securing the contract, signing the contract, doing the whole close over the phone. And we say over the phone, really we're doing dig a digital contract, right? Because you're going to email it, they're going to sign it. But the point is like in person or not in person really is the two differences. It tends to be that virtual wholesaling obviously um, is over the phone, but not necessarily. You could be wholesaling virtual market and your guy on the ground that closes goes on appointment. So just because you're virtual doesn't mean you have to close virtual, right? Yep. You close in person. <clears throat> or if it's your backyard market, like Cody, he's got his backyard market in Utah. They they drop everything, go on appointment when the when the lead qualifies. Uh, or in your Texas market, you got people also there going on appointment. And you're a big believer in live on appointment. Um, and then right now in my business, we're doing most of ours all virtual where we actually close over the phone. And so there's no right or wrong way. There's nuances to both. There's pros and cons to both. And what we hope to do is give you all these ideas, kind of share with you different perspectives, and then you decide, right? So that's kind of what we're hoping to to do on this live stream today. And then for sure, get to those Q&A. So guys, uh, do your very best to, to keep your Q&A relevant to the topic. doesn't have to be, but we're going to try to, we get so many questions that we can't get to everybody. So we're going to try to keep the questions relevant to the topic. If we have time at the very end, then maybe we can just go to whatever questions we can find on there. Does that sound good, Cody? Sounds fantastic. Let's okay. do it. So how should we break this down? Where should we start off? As we talk about <clears throat> which one, is there a, a side of it we want to cover first, pros and cons? How do we want to go about this? And let's uh, let's start breaking this down for them. Because I think as I was sitting here thinking about this all day, this one topic could be a huge difference for a lot of people listening tonight. Could be the difference in them either um, really jumping in one side or the other. That really there they're, they're won't be like this halfway or dipping toes in either side, they're going to either jump in all in on one side or the other. And for that, I'm excited because I think that's where they're going to gain the most traction is when they finally commit to one of these, one of these things and no one's right or wrong. It's just, you're going to literally hear what is going to be sounding best for you to implement and start going all in and not think about, Oh, I'm going to do a little here, do a little here and see which one works out best. The ones that do the best are the ones that just Find the confidence in one of these strategies and just go all in. Let's go. Take action. Do it. Yeah. So I think it's really important, Cody, that we start with a little bit of some qualifiers because the last thing you want to do is be trying to close unqualified leads, um, especially I would think you tell me, Cody, especially going on appointment because your risk goes up quite a bit. If your acquisitions team is on appointment, every time they're on appointment and it doesn't convert there's a bit of a fear of bad use of time, waste of time. Are they on an appointment where they could be on a different appointment that's better? So there's a bit of qualifying in those leads that's really important. And I think a little bit more so if you're doing live appointment closes versus virtual appointment. Yeah. But that's not totally true because if you try to close a virtual deal, meaning when I say, when I'm gonna, I'm gonna say virtual meaning on the phone, when you try to close on the phone, if that's not set up right and you don't you don't create and understand enough of what's going on, you could kill the sale by doing it wrong or at the not, not necessarily wrong, but at the wrong timing, you could shoot yourself in the foot and kill the deal. So we'll talk a little bit about that. But why don't we start with you, Cody? You definitely have some qualifications. You talk about these all the time. I talk yeah. about them all the time. We don't need to spend a ton of time on it. But what what are you looking for to say, go on appointment? What yeah. does that look like? And when do you say this one's not ready to go on appointment. Love this. This is fantastic. And I think what's crucial about what we're going to be talking about, all of them start really with the phone. So it's just at, the, at what point do we close a contract over phone versus going on appointment? That's going to be the differentiator between our conversation tonight. But all of these start with the phone. And I think what Jerry's alluding to on some of these things is these qualifiers, guys. We talk about four pillars. Is this what you wanted me to cover? 
Yeah, I was thinking the, the four pillars, yeah. Perfect. So the qualifier, guys, is really looking at what is it? What is it that we're listening for? Because I think Jerry has a phenomenal script. I know I have a phenomenal script. And you work these scripts, and it will teach you what you need to say, right? But what scripts won't teach you, and I think what this live is going to teach you, is what you're listening for in response to those questions. It's one thing to know the questions, but it's more important to know what to listen for when you ask these certain questions, and more importantly, how to respond to those questions that are that are that they're answering. So the biggest thing is in any script, no matter what you're using, whether you're doing this all on your own, like off the cuff, or whether you have my script or Jerry's script, the biggest thing you can do is make sure that all questions have something in relation to qualifying them to find motivation in four different ways. The first one being timeline or time frame, and it's understanding how quick they need to do this. So if they're telling you they need to move in two days, boom, that's a sign of motivation because guys, all deals, every single deal starts with motivation and equity. Now, obviously there's some financing deals out there, these sub tells and all these different terms, right? That are out there, but we're just going to talk straight wholesaling. If you're just talking wholesaling, um, really the two things you're looking for is motivation and equity. Equity being the difference between what you owe on the property and what the home is worth. That's the equity, but motivation. The first one is timeline. So if they have to move quick, Awesome. That's a sign of motivation. The second one <clears throat> is condition. And the condition, that's easy to kind of sniff out as you start to ask them, like, looks like a fantastic home. And I'd write this down. This is an easy one. Looks like a fantastic home. Why are you considering selling this? So that's that almost like that, uh, like, I'm kind of pulling back, like, man, looks like a fantastic home. Why are you even considering selling this? Let them sell you on why you should come out to this home, right? Versus you selling them on why you should be the buyer of this home. So they start to tell you and say, okay, well, tell me a little bit about the home. When's the last time, um, when's the last time you, you fixed it up? It shows that the home was built in 1970. Is this correct? Yes. Awesome. So you're now finding out the age, but notice how majority of this conversation has nothing to do with the home as much as these, these motivation pillars. So when is the last time the roof, roof was replaced? Well, it's the original roof. Well, it's built in 1970, <laughs> it's 51 years old. That's a problem. There's a sign of motivation. So condition. The third one is price, and I hesitate, and I tell Jerry this all the time, I hesitate to say price is a motivation, is a sign of motivation, because everyone wants the most for their property, just like you want as little to pay for each property. And it's not right or wrong, it's just the seller wants as much as possible, you wanna get it as low as possible. So price most times is going to be a deceiver. It's gonna be, they're gonna throw a kite out there and you've gotta throw down the anchor, right? So we can start the negotiation process. So price most time is a, a, a deceiver, but sometimes they're gonna say a price and you're gonna be like, oh, hot dog. Like, let's get out there. That sounds great. So, right? much, so much so, Cody, that, that you look at price as a deceiver where it doesn't really matter what price they throw out there you're going to go on appointment if the other three factors are in play. A hundred, a hundred percent, a hundred times out of a hundred. Um, price doesn't mean anything. In fact, um, we may talk a little bit about some of those things tonight, but price doesn't mean anything in my book. In fact, I would rather just get off price as fast as possible because why could you, or why should you think they owe you to tell you the lowest rock bottom price out of the gate when a, they don't know you. And people do business, if we know the saying is true, people do business with people they trust. Well, you haven't done anything yet, at this moment at least, to really earn that trust or to really earn that love, like, respect. And so you can't expect them to say, hey, here's my rock bottom price, come out here and, and sign this contract. They're gonna do everything they can by by throwing out this kite. And so don't allow that to be, don't allow that to be a, a sign of motivation. Let me interject on that, Cody, because one of the reasons why you're able to say that is because you know that you're going to go on appointment and you're going to get FaceTime. And if you think about it, guys, nothing is more powerful than face to face, not zoom, not on the phone, not anything else is going to be as powerful as face to face in your ability to connect with that seller, get them to like you and trust you. And people do business with people they like and trust. So what you're doing is you're saying, you know what? I don't really care what price they throw out there because I know if that the if these other three factors are in place, if I can just get in front of that seller, meet them at the property, 
I will be able to build a connection. I'll be able to build rapport. And then we're going to, and then when it comes down to it, we're going to get to the real number and we're going to, we're going to be able to put a deal together or hopefully put a deal together. But that's driven by your ability to your salespeople's ability to build a connection in person, face to face. So uh -huh. where I'm going with this guys is that's a really powerful thing on appointment. Like, you're going to close without a doubt. You're going to close more in person than you ever will be able to on the phone because of that, that one-to-one -one personal belly to belly connection you create on appointment. Now we will, we'll talk about some of the downsides, which is scale is one of them, right? Like I can get through a lot more offers on the phone than I can going on appointment. So there's some value to that, but the same concept still has to apply on the phone. It means, if you get to your if you get to your negotiation part too soon and you haven't built connection, it, you're you're going to lose out on that sale. So it means slow it down. I want to try to recreate as much as I possibly can what Cody tries to do in person, but do it on the phone. In fact, I need to spend even more time because I don't have that face to face, which means I need to be I need to be talking with them, building a relationship, finding out touching on the emotional side of things, you know, talking about stuff unrelated a lot of times, just so that I can create a connection. If I can't yeah. create a connection when it comes to price, I'm not going to, I'm not going to win over the, the person and get the deal. hundred percent, a hundred percent. Um, guys, besides the price, um, the fourth one is, um, the fourth one is the driver. So what's driving them to call you? What's driving them, if you're cold calling them, what's driving them to stay on the phone? Or if Jerry's sending out a postcard, what's driving them to respond to that postcard that's 37 cents when everyone knows 50, 60 realtors, right? And that's our job. Our biggest job is to find out what that driver is. Now, sometimes the list we're mailing to already is telling us what the driver is. Maybe they're behind on their taxes, maybe behind on the mortgage. So we know that stuff, but we don't bring that stuff up. We're not saying, hey, by the way, I noticed you're on the tax delinquent list. Like that's the quickest way to say, see ya, like black ball. We're not going to answer your phone anymore. So it's, it's the driver and you got to find that out. And really it's just coming down to having quality conversations with them and asking tough questions. Um, so that's, those are the four conditions I really, really love. And that allows me to know whether we're going to book it. But more importantly, Jerry, I think that's, that's crucial is it's not just knowing when to book the appointment. There's also a play of knowing whether I want to be the first or the last person on that appointment. Oh, this is um, good. This is good. Yeah. Let's this talk. is crucial. This is crucial because I, I, if someone, if I'm having a conversation with you, Jerry, you're a motivated seller, I think, and I'm talking to you and let's say you actually do want four quotes and you do want four people to come out to give you an offer because you just want the highest and best totally understand. So I'm just going to keep talking with you and we're going to find out some kind of thing that we like, some kind of thing mm -hmm. where we can connect and then we'll just talk back. So Jerry, talk to me. Um, if we were, if, if I'm able to swing by there and if I was able to put something together that just, just made sense, is this something that we could put the agreement together today? If I came by there and we were able to put together something that, that just made sense. And you may respond, no, like maybe you're the analytical, the, the engineer mindset that's like, no, I, I really need four. I'm going to start talking again. I'll be like, well, it sounds like you got some kids in the background. You're like, well, yeah, I've got 10 kids. No way. That's cool. Now, I, I, wish, I, I wish I had the mindset for 10. I can only do four, but tell me a little bit about your kids. What's the ages? And we're going to just start talking for a little bit and we're going to start connecting, building that rapport. And, it'd be, and then maybe we're going to go circle back and we'll be like, Okay. So it sounds like, you know what you want. How soon are you looking to move? Okay. So is there like this, uh, this like, man, no brainer. If, if, if we were able to put something together that just made sense and you're like, man, this does satisfy everything. And I'm able to, I'm able to fulfill this and move on to plan B. If I were able to come out there, I mean, is this something you'd, you'd want to talk together and, and, and put an agreement together? No, no, really Cody. I appreciate you. I will do this three or four times, by the way, to make sure that it's no, no, no. If so, awesome. Well, when are these other guys coming out? Don't be afraid of the competition. Yeah. In fact, I'll ask them. I'll say, so where are you at in the process? How many people do you have coming out? Well, I have four. Awesome. When are those four people coming out? Because I'm convinced that I'm your guy. In fact, I'll send you over a couple of reviews that show you some of this stuff. Start establishing some of the authority. And, um, and I'm interested. So when's your last appointment? Thursday. Awesome. And then what I'll do is I call it the agreement before the agreement. And that is get mini commitments. 
Hey, Jerry, before um, I let you go, it looks like your last appointment's Thursday at three and we agreed on me coming out Thursday at five. Can I get a commitment from you that you'll wait until Thursday at five because I'm really going to pencil in. I'm going to, I'm going to sharpen my pencil and really do my everything on my end to make sure I put something together for you. And here's the best part. Don't make it about price. I never say, ah, it's about price. Like, Hey, I'm going to give you the highest price. Mark my words. Then you just made it about price. I just say, I'm going to do everything I can to get you the money your home qualifies for. And in their mind, they're like, awesome. I have to listen to Cody. I'm going to wait till five. But if you can get them to commit, most people are good enough human beings to also honor that commitment and wait Thursday till five until they've heard all the offers and then come to me. I want to be last. But sometimes through this building rapport, actually, Cody, you know what? I do like you. I've been on your website. I'm looking at this. It seems like you know what you're doing. If we could come up with something reasonable, I guess, I guess I'd be willing to put together an agreement. Boom, I'm booking it and I'm going to be the first one out on the appointment. That's awesome. I love that. So let me recap that for you guys listening right now. What Cody doesn't want to do is he doesn't want to go on appointment and be showing number one, two, or three when the fourth one then can do what Cody just said and said, hey, you've got all your numbers in together. Let's talk about them. Let's look at them and be the one that can now assimilate all this information and maybe offer that seller either price or terms that are going to kind of be in favor. You want to be that guy. But not all sellers do that. I mean, I can't tell you how many private sellers we talk to and I'm the only person they're talking to. Now that's less and less nowadays because people are getting a little bit more educated. They're calling more people, right? And they know the market's hot. So they may wanna see three or four different offers. And so Cody's doing this really good job of trying to find out where am I at? What, and what, and what order in the line am I? If you will take a number now, or I am the only person you're talking to, go on appointment. Uh, if I'm not, then try to understand and figure out where they're at in that process. And you want to be the last one in there to then put a deal together. Dude, a couple things I got to throw on the side so we can make sure we understand some of these people over here. We got Jerry looking 35, bro. Thank you. Um, I think this is a good one. This is a student of yours, Jerry. His question oh, is, oh, hey, Mark. Awesome. How often, how often should you be following up with some leads? And I know that's a big part of this. And so yes. I think this ties in perfect with this. What, uh, what does follow-up look like on people that say, well, maybe. Yeah. So this is very important from every successful wholesaler I know, because I, I like, I like this question too. Um, the money is in the follow-up. All of the money is in the follow-up, meaning uh, wholesaler. 70% of my deals is in the follow-up. Okay. 70%. Yeah. So I love this. I love this statistic. The National Association of Sales, the National Sales Association. So this is all industries. They put out a, a study that said 80% of sales are made between the fifth and 12th follow up. 80%. Okay. Now, if that matches our industry, which I don't see why it wouldn't, you better be following up quite a bit, right? So we look at it like a funnel, and we 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 make contact at not a funnel, a timeline. And we're going to make contact with that seller somewhere on the timeline. Maybe we catch them right at the end when they're highly, highly motivated. I want to close in a week or whatever. That's awesome. But a lot of times we get them way down here where they say, well, you called me. I mean, I'll sell, but hey, you called me. <laughs> right. And so they're very early in the process. But in my mind, a day is going to come where they're going to be ready to kind of pull that trigger. Sure. But I want them to think when they, when that moment in time comes where they're like, you know what, I'm actually ready now. Oh yeah. Cody, Cody's been staying in touch with me. He's the guy I'm going to call about this. Yeah. If you don't stay in front of them often enough, then they're not going to call you. They're going to call whoever else is staying in front of them often enough. Be omnipresent. That's the word I always think of and talk about. Be omnipresent, man. It can be texting, it can be calling, it can be emailing. Just be omnipresent. It could still be that they're on your they're on your postcards going out. And even though you've talked to them, you're still going to send out a postcard. You're being omnipresent. So that's who they're thinking of. And then the second one is be real with them and serve them. Don't find ways to follow up always about the home. That's when they start to say, yeah, you've called enough. And then they're like, eh, it's just Cody's just asking about the home. But if, what if you could give them some quality, quality service during this follow-up where they were debating whether they're going to sell or not because uh, we're debating if we fix and flip it. Awesome. If you fix and flip it and you fix it up yourself, what are you looking to fix? Well, we need to fix up the windows. My follow-up is I'd find out a list of them and use every one of these individually as an individual follow-up. And so the first one is going to be, hey, Jerry. I met you a couple of weeks ago and I know you're debating about the fix and flip or whether to sell it to uh, someone like me. 
Um, but I remember you said something about the windows need to be fixed up. And right now, Amsco Windows, they're doing a buy one, get one free. And I just happened to see that. I just want to make sure that you knew about it because I knew that was something that if you were going to fix and flip it on your own, that you were going to swap, swap out the windows. And so I'll, I'll send you over. I'll be sure to send over that coupon. Now they're like, dude, Cody just literally called me and served me and helped me out. And now they're thinking, if I ever do business with someone, it's going to be Cody because this yeah. dude genuinely is serving me. Or, or you might say, you know what? I was talking with my contractor. He's got an opening in his schedule. He's got some downtime. He can give you a good deal. Um, you know, I just wanted to call and let you know here, here he is. He can come over and take care of that for you. Right. So that's that adding value all the time. And it's amazing, Cody. I know you have this happen to you all the time. People will sell me their house, not because I'm the best price, but because I've created a relationship and they like and trust me. And so I'll get deals sometimes that are, that aren't the best price just because people want to do that. They want to yeah. do business with people they like and trust. So that's that's how important that is to build that relationship. And going back to um, going back to the whole point of don't let price do it, as long as you see those other pillars, like Jerry said, as long as there's those other pillars, book it. Get off of price as fast as you can. Do not focus on price. Do not negotiate. Me, I don't negotiate over phone. I don't let my team negotiate over phone. Now, there's a point where we have to because maybe they're out of state and they own a home in Utah or in my Texas market, but they don't live in those states. And so we have to talk about it at some point. And maybe we'll get to that point tonight or not. But I never talk price over phone. And so I get off it as fast as I can. I treat it like as if it was cancer in my body, cut it out. I cut it out of my conversation. Someone says I need 350 and the home is maybe worth 200,000. I'll be like, awesome. It obviously sounds like you know what you want for it. So tell me a little bit more about the house. And I just move on. Yeah. And now I just don't even make it a problem. I'm not going to say 350. Come on. How did you come up with that number? I don't care how they came up with that number. I haven't done anything to earn their respect. I haven't done anything to earn their trust. They don't need to tell me 200 right now. I'm just going to go find out if there's any of these other pillars of motivation. If so, I'm booking the appointment. The price will always, always change. Yep. And that's because you understand the value of the relationship over the price up front now, right? Because that will happen later. So you're so then you're looking for those three pillars, Cody. Now, will you go on appointment if you don't have all three of the four? So price is a deceiver, so you don't base it on that. But do you require all three? No, no. So and and very rarely does it have all three or all four. Um, or even three of the four. Sometimes it's just time crunch. I had a guy call me in the 11th hour and it's Monday and he has to close by Thursday or he gets foreclosed on. And so it's no, just time alone is like, well, you just forfeited your op your opportunity to work with a realtor. You yeah. probably are not going to keep this as a rental. So really your option is someone like me to come out and you're going to love working with me because I'm going to treat you with all the kindness like you're my family. Yeah. Okay. So then it doesn't have to be any of the three. Now let's talk for a minute, Cody. I'd love to talk about this, uh, some of the pros and cons, right? So I think it's pretty clear. We talked about it for a minute. When you go on appointment, you've got a much better opportunity to create that rapport. Um, the downside on, to going on appointment is it's time consuming and you can only go on so many appointments. Um, once you grow your business to where that person is maxed out, you got to bring on more team now, right? So you got to add another acquisitions person probably. And I'm not sure if you know these stats right off the top of your head, but you know, you don't close every appointment. So you're, there's a percentage of, uh, of closes per appointment and you want to be watching and tracking that number and, and really understanding that because where is there a breakdown somewhere or are we in line with where we want to be, you know, with our close ratio, maybe there's some negotiating things that need worked on. But if you really think about it at, at the end of the day, there's only so much time. It takes time to travel, time to meet, time to do all these things. And that's where there could be made an argument for the virtual model, which is if I'm not going on appointment, my team can close or at least make more offers over the phone. And maybe we can offset some of that uh, over the phone versus live in person. So if, if, one, if one acquisition person can close five a month on the phones, we might be able to close 10 a month but we're going to probably go through a lot more leads because we're going to get a lot more no's because we're not meeting in person. How does all of this balance out? And I think there's there's probably a balance where you might be able to get to more offers over the phone, but then your close ratio is probably going to be a lot lower. But can you scale it more? And where does it all fit in? Right. So I think that's yeah. kind of 
at least that's the question to be asking or the thing to be considering when you compare the two. Would you agree? Amazing, amazing detail in what you're asking there. And everyone's going to, here's the thing at the beginning stages, and here's my, my answer to this and my beginning stages, I have to be selective on what appointments to go on. Cause it's only me. Solopreneur is one of the da most dangerous places to be in, right? Because you have to wear all the hats and you don't know how much time you should be spending on acquisition versus disposition versus marketing. Cause you're, you're doing all of them. And so you got to be selective. You can't just go on every appointment. The beauty is, is I, I I'll take a page from your book that I really, really love. And that is a couple lives ago we had the Arthurs on and they're like, I want to get to the point, Jerry, that I am doing 10 fix and flips every single month. And you're like, no, you don't. <laughs> and, and it was just like straight to the point. Cause you're like, I got to that point and it is a nightmare it is a headache. And I would rather do less, but get higher margin. And so that's the same philosophy I run when it comes to at least how I do it is Less is more to me because I can also make more instead of making a, most times over the phone, what I come to find out is I'm very hard to stand out anything different or unique other than price. And so maybe my assignment, yes, I can get deals, but maybe my assignment would have been better had I been in person. And that's some of the things that we're always testing. But because I want that lifestyle, like you want your lifestyle, and I'm not the one going on all the appointments, we have a process in place and I'll hurry and break it down in two seconds why this works for us really well and why if you did this method, it would make sense. But if you're not looking to go this method, there, there's other methods. And Jerry, I want you to speak on some of those other methods that might fill in the gap. Um, is I have three acquisition managers in Utah alone. Their goal is to never have more than any at any given moment, 25 leads each that they're working. And their 25 leads are ones that are closing in 30 days or less. They're not going to close in 60 days. They're not going to close in 90 days. That's going to be another member on the team that is going to do that. Our lead management system is on the 30 plus up to 90 days. And anything, anything over 90 days, our cold callers are doing the follow-up with. Okay. And so now their focus is, I have these 25 leads that I know at some point have to sell within the next 30 days. That's my focus, all three of them. Their goal is to go on as many appointments as possible, but it's because none of this other stuff is under their management which would bog them down, which would also stop the flow of deals coming their way. Because we have a process of place and a team in place, we're able to allow them to just do what they do best and go on, uh, go on these appointments face-to-face -face and really increase the odds of closing the deal versus um, if you don't have that process in place, now they're like, well, I can't go on all these appointments because I still got to follow up on all the 30 to 60 day closes or the people that might close in the next 90 days or the people that might be closing in the next 120 days. But because we have a process in place, it's really just focused and hone in. You've got 25 leads and they're all 30 days or less. That's all you're focused on. Each one of you guys is uh, 25 leads a piece and that's it. And it works for us because of the process or the system. Yeah, that's great. So then you're not burning out your, your closers on um, not, not so much cold leads, but not, not 30 day closing leads. They're, they need some more hand holding. That's right. So then those 25 a month, Cody, are they, um, how often do you replenish the 25? Is that a weekly thing where they, where you flush out whoever's not progressing? No. So really all it is, I mean, if it happens to do that, there may be a point that they're at a high, they're maybe someone's at 28 or 30. Okay. But really, if you think about your deals that are only closing in 30 days or less, it, it really isn't high as you think it is. Um, and, and what happens is you get, you get really good at your focus and where your time should be driven. Um, you'll realize that 70, 80% of your time really should only be focused on those leads. Well, you can't forget about these other leads. And so that's why I love, I look at that lifestyle and think of instead of casting the widest net possible and making as much offers as possible, it's like, how can I work deep with these individuals so that we're omnipresent and more people are going with us more than anyone else because they're like, I just love these people. And that's important with all salespeople, really, because if you give your sales team too many leads, they're going to work 50 leads in the same time they have to work 25. So you're, you just dilute your lead qual your quality of managing leads. So when you Check say, mark. yeah, when you give them 25, what you found, Cody, is that's enough leads for them to really give it the right attention. And the salespeople know, I don't get more leads. These are my leads. I've got to work these leads. Yeah. So then all of a sudden you'll find your close ratios go way up because you're not, they want to tell you, oh, I need more leads. I need more leads. 
because every salesperson wants the low hanging fruit, right? Yeah. Easy ones. So this forces them to really nurture their leads to close at a top capacity, which is absolutely critical when you're spending money on marketing. You want to maximize your marketing dollars. And the way you do that is you make sure your salespeople are maximizing every lead they get. 100%. And they can jump from pool to pool. If I could draw this little drawing, it's not a snowman, I promise. Um, but the littlest amount of your leads, the 25 per acquisition manager, that's your smallest pool of, of, of leads. And then you got your medium, your people that are going to close between like 30 and 90 days. And then anything over 90 days is, is over here. Um, and these jump from pool to pool, from pond to pond. And so you may have someone acquisition manager that's on the 25 and all of a sudden they've gone cold and now they get kicked over to the cold call team or they've gone medium. So they get kicked over to the lead manager and vice versa. The manager's like, Ooh, this one's ready. Kicks it up to the hot or Ooh, this one got cold, kicks it over to the cold call. And so they're always jumping these ponds. These fish are jumping back and forth in these ponds. And it's just, because we're dialed in in the process, we know who's going to be doing the follow-up and we're really good at that to making sure that we don't let those slip through the crack. Um, but yeah, that's, that's the process on why I like it. But I, again, maybe a, a real time story that just took place on Friday. We had four individuals go out on this appointment and we were the last ones on Friday by design. So we send out our acquisition manager, they're talking and they're like, well, because two of them haven't really given a price, which is smart for the other acquisition managers. We never give a price unless someone's willing to close right then and put a, a home, like put the agreement together. So they did their, they played their cards well. Um, but we knew there was a deal there. We're like, this price is just, it's ready. We, there's just something holding back. So what we did is from there, acquisition manager calls my business, uh, my business partner, Mark, and says, hey, there's something here. Can you make a call out to them to let them know you're aware of this? We're working on this. So it just gives her another contact point. So Mark makes this other contact point and says, hey, uh, Connor called me and said the appointment went well. This went on, this went on. We're looking to serve you. Is there anything over and above this that maybe um, he missed that you'd be willing to share with me that would help you um, get from plan A to plan B? And she's like, you know what? That's what makes me nervous is I don't know what plan B looks like. So over the next four hours, Mark ends up talking through plan B, like you're, you're here at plan A, but you want to get to plan B. And they started talking about this journey, how to get to plan B. Once that would just discover, she's like, you know what? I love you guys. You guys have been great. Um, let's do that. Connor goes back out and gets the contract. And so it's, it's, it's a validates what you're saying five to 12 touches, but more importantly, it's that understanding them. And then she felt a second pinpoint. She loved Connor. She's like, you were the kindest guy. You've been the, like, you've been the most understanding. You've done the most due diligence. And then to see it from a second person being like, man, I love this company. They're all kind, genuine individuals. And that's what took place. And we got that deal. And, and could it have happened over the phone? It might have. I, I, I think I'm biased to the point that maybe on this one, it would have been a little bit difficult because we were going up against four in-person people. But maybe, maybe, but I think it would have been definitely a higher price point. She wanted 300,000. We got it for 275. And the other people were, one of them already offered the 300,000. Wow. But because of that relationship, that's great. So Cody, let's talk now about when we get to price though, because whether you defer it until you go on appointment, you wait until you've created more relationship. At some point, clearly price has to be the conversation because we got to sign a contract or, you know, an agreement and get it in place and it's got to be a deal. Yeah. Now you very much follow the same philosophy I follow in my business, which is a margin, a margin model. You actually do really well at, at combining margin and volume, but, but you, you want to make sure that you're, you're only doing deals that have good margin on them. Um, and whether that's wholesaling, flipping, whatever business model it is, I think you agree with me that doing less deals with bigger profits, is way more conducive to lifestyle than doing a bunch of small deals with skinny margins. Uh, those are actually for me, the har are, are even harder deals. They're way more harder. The sellers are more needy. There's more problems. <laughs> it's just more drama, more headache for smaller profits. Like, why are we doing these? You know? Right. And you'll find that you'll find that um, when you hold out on price, you maybe <laughs> deals, maybe you do less deals because you hold out on your number. But you're going to do a whole lot. You're going to do a whole lot less, but a whole lot more profitable deals. And you're going to win in the end. At the end of the year, you're going to win out big time by focusing on margin over volume. That's my personal belief. I know a lot of people 
that are very, very high margin, low or very, very high volume, low margin. So they'll 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 chase after the three thousand dollar deals. I don't I don't want any part of that. Like I don't we don't even touch those because yeah. it, it's just not worth all the effort in tying up my team and everything else. So how how does that go for you? So you're on appointment. Maybe they threw out a, a deceiver number, but you've now got to have that heart to heart. You feel like the timing's right. You feel like you build rapport. How do you now talk price to that seller? And we're going to do a, a live in person and maybe what might be different on the phone. Okay. I love that. Guys, I really, I can't, I can't tell you enough. This is stuff I share with my clients that pay me, um, pay, pay premium for this one. They join me on a Tuesday where I train them. Um, take notes on this. I'm going to share some top notch. You can mail your check to Cody. He'll put the address up. <laughs> That's right. That's right. I'm going to show you top notch, top notch stuff right now. Please, please, please take notes on this one because this verbiage is going to change everything when you're going out there and negotiating in person. And I'm, ex I'm, 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 I'm really excited to see what you do on the phone. Um, so in person, you've talked to it, you're getting to the point of price and always remember he or she who says their price first loses. That's it. He or she that says their price first loses. You've got to get them to say their price first period. The end, never be the first to throw that out there. Um, had we done one just about two months ago, they wouldn't, they wouldn't, they wouldn't, they wouldn't. And so we're like, man, let's just do 320 because this is a this is a good anchor. Anchor, guys. Yeah. After we talked one more time, like, what's like your get out of here tomorrow so you can go to Disneyland? Cause they wanted to move, they wanted to move to Orlando. I'm like, like, what's your get out of here prize tomorrow and go enjoy Mickey Mouse? And they're like, 315. It was five thousand less than what our anchor was gonna be. Had we <laughs> said 320, it would have ended up probably at 330. We yeah. ended up getting it at 315. So no, 305, because we end up getting it lower than that. Um, so guys, that's crucial. Get the price first. When I say the number after them, Jerry throws out a number of 300,000. I'm going to throw out an anchor. And guys, here's the two things you need to know. I learned this from Chris Voss and it stands true in wholesaling. And that is, it has to be unrealistic and it has to solicit a no. If it's not unrealistic, you broke the rule. And if it, if they say yes to your offer, you didn't go low enough. You failed yourself. So it has to be unrealistic and it has to solicit a no. Don't run away from no. No is the beginning of all negotiation. And so unrealistic. Jerry, my warm and fuzzy on something like this is right around 200,000. Let's role play maybe for two seconds. Yeah. Act like a real seller that when you hear that, what are you going to say to me? 300,000. I'm looking for 300,000. Well, Jerry, my warm and fuzzy is probably around the 200,000. I can't do 200. I mean, my neighbor's house just sold for 300,000. Now, again, this is this is warm and fuzzy, Jerry. Okay. But uh, tell me this. How close can you get to that number? I think I've got some room to come down. Yeah. I mean, if, if you met my other my, my other terms, I might be able to to work a little bit more on that price. But I I really want to be, you know, around that 300,000 number. Yeah, I know in a perfect world, perfect world for you is 300, perfect world for me, 200. But really, in all reality, as you as you hear that, how close can you get to that number? Um, I mean, I could probably come down to like two, 285. I'd probably, okay. probably do 285. So guys, this is real time and this is what you'll see, by the way. But look what I did. I, I feel like I feel like I owe you like to come down. Because you're you're asking the question, and you're being persistent, and you're there's this awkward silence where I'm kind of like, well, you know, I want to put a deal together here, it's, you know, like, so it just feels really compelling for me. Like I naturally want to come down. Yeah. No. And and here's the thing. Notice I did not negotiate 285. You negotiated against yourself. The best part about negotiating, guys, is you don't have to negotiate. You just got to throw out something that's like no. And you may even get the hell no. Like it's going to be low. You've got to be unrealistic and solicit a no. So you say 200,000 and then like, I can't do that. And so then you ask them. So how close can you get to that number, Jerry? And just sit there. Yeah. And Jerry said 285. Guess what he just did? He negotiated against himself 15,000. I didn't. He did. But I use this same line, guys. I just used this on my excavation bid for my uh, ex my detached garage in my backyard. I use this all the time. They're like, we can do this for 18,000. I said, is that the best you can do? Yeah. I'm like, why? I thought this was going to be around like 8,000. There's my anchor. And they're like, 8,000? That doesn't even cover concrete. And I'm like, 
how close can you get to that number? And we got him down to 14, guys. Four yeah. grand. That's you're a Disney trip. Because your fault when I said 285, your follow-up then is is that the best you can do? Is that the best you can do? Or I'll do this. I appreciate that. I validate it. That was a stretch for you. Yeah. I appreciate that. When we start talking, maybe we're going to talk about other things. But if we want to keep yeah. talking negotiation, then I'd say, Jerry, I do appreciate that. I, I, I realize there's some gap there. Um, I can't do 285, but what if, what if I could do, bring mine up to 220? And maybe your max allowable offer is 230, by the way. So yeah. maybe you start at 210, 215. And you sit there and they're like, come on, like we're not even, we're not even in the same ballpark. Okay. Well, before we even talk numbers, let's, let me just make sure I understand if I was able to do this and I'm able to purchase your home, Jerry, what are you expecting for me to do besides just purchase it? What are some of the things that you're expecting that I do? And when they start talking about it, they may not understand that you're buying it as is. They may not understand. Like that's where I think negotiation goes. So, so we think they hear you the first time you say it. Sometimes it's in one ear and out the other. And they don't even know what as is means. They don't know that there's no closing costs, no realtor fees, that you can close on your date. They don't even know this. So you have to reiterate and say, okay, so are you closing, covering your closing costs or are you expecting me to? Yeah. Well, I wouldn't mind covering my closing costs. Woo, scratch that out of my contract, right? That just saved me some money. Mm -hmm. Or maybe they say, yeah, I want you to. Okay. So if I'm able to cover your closing costs, fantastic. Um, what else were you expecting? Well, we're hoping we don't have to fix this up. So you're saying if I can buy this in this condition and if I'm able to put something together that makes sense where I can buy this where you don't touch it, that makes value, okay. And then you're writing this down. What else? And now they start to see this like, oh my gosh, I can see where Cody's at. But Cody built this platter in front of me again for the second or third time and I finally got it. Cody's gonna buy it as is and now I understand what that means. Cody's going to buy it on the day that I want it to close on. And I understand what that means. Cody's going to cover all closing costs, which normally is on me, but Cody's taking those over. I get it. This is making sense. And because Cody's adding so much value here, you're right. I can sacrifice my price because of all this speed and convenience that Cody's offered me on this silver platter. And now it makes sense. And I want to accept your offer. Yeah. And Cody, one thing I'll add to that is once you've narrowed that gap and let's say you're still not quite there right so so let's say you you're at 230 they're at 250 right you so you've done a really good job of coming from three down to 250 but you're still not where you want to be on your number what i'll often do guys and i'll share i'll share a quick tip here is i'll often then start to use my terms to 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 create more value to them and not my price so what are some things you could do you could you could close sooner if that's important to them Maybe you close sooner. Um, you could provide some some services like we'll do. Hey, you know what? We can find you a new apartment. We can cover your first month, your your rent. Uh, we'll do the trash out for the property, so you don't have to worry. But I start to think of what things can I do that will be valuable to them, but actually lower no cost to me to be able to put a deal together. Because we we sometimes think that the only thing we negotiate is price. One of the things I'll often do, Cody, is I'll, I'll switch to creative financing. So if they're at 250, I'm at 230. I'll say to them, I'll say, well, if I could get you your number, we're off a little here, but if I could get you your number, would you be willing to wait to get some or all of your money? And I'll leave it at that. Meaning, will you carry something for me? Uh, and you can wholesale that deal 10 times easier because now you're creating less cash out of pocket for your buyer so you can get a premium on those deals. But what if let's say they owe 150 on a loan and you get them to let you carry that subject too, right? And, and now you're willing to come up some on price because you created a creative financing situation, which now increases the value of that deal. So that you start to just open up this world if you're willing to think outside the box, you've got to think outside the box. And so that's what I love about what Cody's just explaining here. He circles back around to the benefits, which is closing fees, closing fast, you know, all those things that are that are important, but not price. Yeah. Now you create some more room to negotiate with those other things. And you let them. So you ask that question. So if 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 you want me to do these things, what is that worth to you? And you can ask them. And they'll sometimes say, I get that. Yeah. I'd be willing to do it for 225, like you were asking, if yeah. you'd be willing to cover all those things. 
one thing I did, Cody, with one of these is we were off like that. And I said to them, I said, so let's say it was two, I forget what the numbers, but let's say it's 250. I'm at 230. They're 250. I'm 230. And I was listening the whole time to what their concerns were and what their, and their plan was, is when they sell, they were going to use the cash, their equity to then, you know, buy something else. So I said to them, I said, you know what? Um, what if I released some of the cash early so that you could use that for your next move? So you could, and, and I knew it was important because they had said things like, I need the money, right? So then what happens was, and now I wouldn't do this if I didn't have clear title and everything worked out. I had my buyer, whatever I'm going to sure. do. But I ended up releasing like $10,000 early before closing to give them that cash in their pocket to then do their next thing they needed to do. It, was, it, didn't, it didn't affect anything else other than I released some of the money. Now, again, be careful doing that. I wanted to make sure that we had clean title. All the other things were in place. So I said we had to make sure all of that. But I ended up allowing them to get a little bit of that cash, which helped them with their situation. But because of that value by offering that, they came down like 25000 in price. Yeah. Because I'm creating yeah. value. So tell me this then. Because I love everything you're saying, but here's what the one thing now, how do you do that? What are some of the things you're doing on phone when you're talking price? Like you're, you're just saying, is it the exact same process? You're just listening and, and swapping off? It's exactly the same, only harder. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Because without a doubt, I, I, when I'm doing this on the phone, Cody, in my mind, I'm thinking, man, if I was sitting at the kitchen table right now, I would have this signed. Yeah. No, I'm eyeball it with this person, you know, yeah. like, let me cry with you about your situation. You know, let's hug COVID. Yeah. Let's hug, right. Um, walk me through this. Help me. And man, oh, I totally, I, I can totally feel what you're saying. That emotional side is so difficult to do on the phone that, but everything else, like all the stuff we're talking about, it's all the same. It's just harder. Have you done this? Because here's the question I have. Like I sit there and I think if I was doing this over phone, the way I would probably think outside the box is I would either do FaceTime or a Zoom call so they, they can at least start to get a, a face of who I am that, oh my gosh, he's a he's a likable guy. And hopefully they like my smile or something. Like Definitely. I would do something that separates me. Definitely. So Zoom is going to be way better. It's still not as good. Yeah. So you want to do that. You definitely want to do that because that's going to help because you're, yeah. you're now you're like you guys watching right now, hopefully you're creating a connection with Cody and I, not as good as if you came to one of our live trainings, not even anywhere near as good, but it's still better than just on the phone. So for sure. Yeah. 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 Here's a good question. Aventuras de la Biblia says, <laughs> how should I present myself to sellers? I know that I'm not to say that I'm a wholesaler. Um, a wholesaler, I, that's a good point. I, I don't, yeah, I don't present myself as a wholesaler and nor do I like the word investor, to be honest. Investor screams like the word contract versus agreement. Agreement yeah. sounds nice. Contract sounds ugh, binding. Get my attorney to look at it. So I don't like wholesaler. I don't like investor. What I use is just a home buyer. Yep. Local home buyer. I'm here. I buy homes in the state of Utah. Yeah. So one, thing, one thing that I like to do is go in. You, you have to go into this conversation already knowing that there's a wall. Yeah. You're an investor. You're here to steal my house. That's what they're thinking. Yep. You have to tear that wall down by building relationship of trust. So one of the things that I'll do, and I know where this, I think I know where you're going. A lot of people are like, hey, do I disclose that I'm going to wholesale their property? No. What I say is I say me and or my team or me and my group of investors or me and my partners, we buy houses and sometimes we, sometimes we rent them, sometimes we flip them, sometimes we do different things. Uh, but rest assured seller, we are going to do everything we're telling you we're going to do. You don't have to worry about that. We're going to perform on our contract or perform on our agreements. And so really what this, what you're, if you think about what you really want to do, you want to reassure and help that seller feel comfortable that you're going to perform. Yeah. Uh, but guys, what the exit strategy is on a deal has no bearing on what the seller really wants, which is their problem solved. So get away from that. Stop thinking that, you somehow have to tell the seller that you're going to not close. You're going to sign their contract for more money. You don't need to even have that conversation. I never have that conversation. It never even comes up. No, no. But more importantly, just go off that. Less is more. 
Um, it's no different than when like, well, how do you talk to them about setting up an inspection? Like, are they going to be pissed off at 20 people? I just keep it light and friendly. Hey, Jerry, one of the big things now that we've done this, we put the agreement together. I'm excited. We're looking to close on the 20th. What I'm going to do is have my contractors and partners go through this on, we're looking at probably Wednesday at 5 p.m. It's me and a small army. We're going to be walking through here and just getting everything prepped and ready to go. So the right when we close, I'm ready to go on my end to start doing what I, what we hope and plan to attend, uh, attend on or plan on doing for, sure. for this property. And that's it. Leave it at that. Um, I don't wholesale. I don't talk about, Hey, we wholesale your home. But by the way, how we wholesale your home is we're really, we're not buying it. We're just trying to sign the contract. It's just, <laughs> yep. It's just me or me. Some of my partners, there's quite a few different strategies depending if we rehab it or whether we end up uh, keeping it as a rental ultimately at the end of the day, um, me or, or my partners, we're, uh, we're going to figure out what's the best for us and we're going to just keep moving forward. I'll even say to them, you know what? I may pass this off to one of my partners and let them see it through. I'm not sure. I don't know yet. But, and then I move it right back to what they really want is reassurance that you're going you're gonna to help them in their situation. 100, 100%. And really, that's all they care about, Jerry. Like, I think, I think so many times we think we have to go deep and I think everything is going smooth until you go deep and all of a sudden they're like, red flag, why are you doing this? Yeah. And all they care about is, listen, Home Slice, you told me you're going to close on the 20th and I'll have X amount of dollars at, at, at closing. I don't care. Go do it. Um, that's really what they're, they're like, just go. Yeah, go do it. I, yeah. They just don't care. And so um, that's, that's as easy as that. Now, I will throw out there, we've talked about this on the live streams before. Uh, this is actually something Cody taught me that I was not doing that we've since implemented in our business. Let's go! Own, um, when you get to that point and you have that agreement on price is I do not send the contract, right? I do not send the purchase agreement unless they're in front of their computer or on their phone ready to sign because they will shop your offer with that written contract that you just provided them. And, and so I was talking, this is really funny. I was talking to Cody about that and Cody said, you know what's going on, Jerry? And I said, what? Cause what was happening was we were agreeing on price. I'd send over the offer and I get ghosted. Crickets. Where'd they go? <laughs> We had a deal and Cody's like, they're shopping your, they're shopping your deal. And I'm like, no, no, they're not. No way. No way. Sure enough. They are because what happened was I never told you this part of the story. So I went back on that deal and I looked up, I looked up on a title and I saw who closed and it's a, I know the guy and I'm like, he was right in behind me or he was the other one on the table that they were talking to. And he, and, and then I saw the price and it was like a thousand dollars more than my offer that they had in writing now. Sure. Yeah. Every time. This is the one that this quote that's like Ron Burgundy, but to the negative is like 30% of the time it works every time. Guys, they're shopping you every time, like every, every time when you send it over. So since then, what have you done? Because I think this is a valuable, valuable, for those that are going to do deals over the phone, there's times where we have to, again, out of state owner, I have to resort to the phone, but there's a specific, like specific, yeah. Process we follow. What do you do now to make sure that you get that agreement? So two things. First, I want to kind of share the philosophy because if you get the philosophy, you'll understand how to put stuff together. My, my philosophy is um, get it in writing first, ask questions later. Get it in writing first, finish your due diligence later. Get that thing in writing, right? You can always, if you, if you uncover something later, you can always negotiate, renegotiate or terminate. What I don't want to do is hang up the phone until somebody can walk the property and verify condition. Uh, okay, I'm going to later tonight when you got time, you know, let's get back on the phone. No, I'm on the phone. I want to say, hey, it's coming over right now. Are you in front of your computer? Oh, you're, it's, you're not going to be in front of your computer for 15 minutes? No problem. Hey, let's chit chat for 15 minutes until you get home and you're in front of your computer. I want to do everything I possibly can to not hang up. Uh, get that over to them. Now, for me, we can do them in 10 seconds, right? Because it's their boilerplate. We add, like put the address, put the name, put the price. Docu sign it over. We do it through my system Flipster, but you can do it through whatever. And I do not want to hit go until they say to me, I'm in front of my computer. You've got my email. Send it. Let's walk through it right now. And we yeah. walk through it on the phone, just like you do, Cody, in person. Answer questions. Make sure they're comfortable with everything. Boom, sign. Love then don't worry about, do I actually even have a deal, right? Because I want to make sure I'm not spending time on due diligence 
without a written agreement in place or I'm wasting my time. Someone else is going to come in and get it out from under me or whatever could happen, right? It goes cold and I lose it. By the way, guys, I appreciate this and I saw this and I actually, if you wouldn't mind, if you know someone that really could hear this and like, man, I wish so-and-so was on this so they could hear this, please, please, please share this. If there's a way to share this, is there a way to share this on YouTube as well? Oh, sure. The link. You can share the link. Yeah. Share the link. Get your friends on here. Get your team on here. If you're like, man, I wish my acquisition managers ping them in, get them over here. We would absolutely honor and thank you guys for doing that because that, that that shows a lot of love back. So if you guys can share that, please do that. That's uh, that's awesome stuff. Um, so thank you for those that, that said that and, and brought in. I saw a guy say, I brought in five people on my team. We're listening to this right now. Um, so this is, this is fantastic guys. We're going to keep on going for a little bit. Um, so ultimately, are you pro closing everything over the phone? Is there a part of you that says, oh my gosh, I want to do this in person. Where do you stand when you hear some of these things? Well, so I just know the reality of everything. That's all. So I'm just real Cody, you know, like I don't, I don't sugarcoat it. I will never tell somebody virtual is better than in person because it's not true. And just like I would just <laughs> tell somebody, uh, this is the only lead type you should do, or this is the best lead type, or this is the best market. None of that's true. Everything is about you, your business model, your market, your, your abilities, right? Yeah knowledge of things, your negotiations. There's so many factors, but what you do have to decide is what works best for you, what resonates best with you, what do you feel strongly about, and then do that. You may, you may align with Cody and say, no way, I want my acquisitions team in that market. I want them on appointment because I know I can close more that way. Or you may say, you know what, I love the idea of being in different markets. I love the idea of, of not having uh, having having closers that can close on the phone and not be in the market, that resonates with me, but I know the, I'm just real with the nuances. I know yeah. that I have a harder time closing, which means I think I'm probably spending more in marketing than you are, Cody, because I'm not closing as many deals. Yeah. And I just know that. Yeah. So I, I just offset things with what what resonates a little bit more with me. Love it. Here's something that I think is a great question that goes hand in hand because you get this out there you get the you get the contract you put the home under you get the agreement put together and then the concern is again going back to well wait a second how do you get cash buyers to inspect my deals without sale knowing i'm wholesaling and that goes back to just prepping don't dodge crucial conversations address all elephants everything even from prepping from the moment you're on the call i always do this guys and i tell you this does not solicit the opposite if you do it. So when I'm on the phone and I'm pre-approved, like pre-getting all the things I need to know, see if there's any kind of conditions or any kind of motivation out there, the big thing is address the elephant. Do not leave the elephants unaddressed. Meaning when I'm out there and I'm gotten on the phone and they haven't said anything about other cash offers, I'll literally say, where are you at within the process? They're like, well, we're just at the beginning stages. Awesome. Have you entertained any other cash offers? And sometimes by asking that, naturally the human side says, man, why are you asking that? Now you're soliciting for them to go get more cash offers. <laughs> they're, not. they're not going to. They're either going to or they're not going to. And if they're going to, I want to know that because that's how I start to find out, should I be first or should I be last? So I address every elephant. I always do. How soon are you looking to move? Perfect. If you had a crystal ball, what does this all look like? Address the elephant. Have you thought about listening to the agent? Obviously, that's the way to get the highest and best for your number. And if they're going to be like, well, no, I haven't thought about this. And if they're like, well, I don't know if I should work with you. And maybe they're starting to be cold a little bit on the phone. Dress the elephant. Hey, Jerry, I'm not the highest offer. Would that stop us from doing business today? And they're like, well, no, it doesn't stop for new business. Boom, they got them reengaged. I now have a little bit of motivation there. It doesn't bug them. But when we don't address the elephant and we just kind of just casually go around the conversations, you're really blind leading the blind and you're not going to do anything good. You're not going to land any deals. Negotiation has an art to it. It does have, yeah. have a method, a process to follow. And I want to address every elephant. Have you talked to realtors? Are you entertaining other cash offers? Um, where are you at in the process? Have you received any other offers al already at this point? 
I need to know that. That's how I prep when I'm going out to meet with this individual. And then at the end, I'm prepping this. I'm addressing the elephant. Hey, we're going to be doing an inspection of the home. We're looking at probably Wednesday the 5th. But if you make it a problem, it's going to be a problem. It's going to be me and a small army. Me, some contractors, and uh, and some partners. And we're just going to go through the home and just do our final touches and make sure we're prepped for everything on our end. Um, yeah. we're, we're looking Wednesday at 5 o'clock. Boom, go on, move on. It's no different than when I ask you, Jerry, on the phone. If I said, hey, what's owed against the property? Most times you're going to get the kickback. What does that have to do with making an offer? What does that have to do with buying my house? What is that your business? None of your business. You're going to get these kickbacks. But I need to know this because this helps me prep in what is my exit strategy? What kind of options can I bring them? And so I literally say this. If they say, uh, what does that have to do with it? Or uh, that's none of your business. I'll say, what I usually do is sometimes a cash offer isn't the best option. So I just want to make sure I have plenty of options for you to pick from. So Jerry, what's owed against the property? No different than when I asked him twice. So how close can you get to that number? And then just sit there quietly. You have to do it. Don't dodge it. Don't be all of a sudden like you were saying, hey, what's owed against the property? And then after they say any kind of resistance, you're like, <sighs> um, so um, if you don't mind, Jerry, um, I, I mean, you don't have to, but I mean, it, uh, it does help. Um, what's owed against your property? They're like red flag, moving on next person. I don't get this person. He was confident and then he lost confidence. So I'm going to stay confident and do it in a nice cordial way. Hey, what's owed against the property? None of your business. Well, the main thing is, is a cash offer may not always be the best solution. And I might be able to bring up some other solutions. So what's owed against the property, Jerry? Yeah. Right. Circled right back around. Go right back to it. Same authority. Move in confidently. And they're like, oh, that makes sense. Yeah, I owe 150. Awesome. Yeah. And guys, this question, Diego, there's some really easy ways to solve some of this. So two things. Cody mentioned he does he does an inspection party, which is like an open house. So he creates a window of time. I do the same thing. You create a window of time. You tell your cash buyers, this is your opportunity to see the property. That's the only opportunity to see the property. Bring your partners, bring your contractors, bring bring your investors. And then now what you're doing is instead of creating 50 different times where a cash buyer has to see the property and potentially run into the seller, you have one time when that's happening. And then we offer our seller a hundred dollar gift card to not be home during the inspection party. So then they're out of there. So there's really actually not very much opportunity for cash buyer to talk to seller now, could your seller go back around and knock the door and do all of that stuff? <laughs> sure, you know that could happen. But really, when I see that question, it's um, it's usually somebody fearful about something that's more than likely never going to happen. Or it's a what if situation. What if this happens? It's not by experience. It's because they're already thinking. What if this happens? What if doesn't happen ninety five percent of the time? It doesn't happen very often. Yep. And have those addressing elephant in the room questions with your cash buyers. Hey guys, we're going to be out here. It sounds like you have interest. You're going out there. Awesome. Let me tell you how this goes down. We're going to meet out there and we're going to meet about 10 minutes early. Those that are there, we're going to sit there in a circle in the lawn and I'm going to go over this one more time, but I'm going to tell you right now also is no questions to the seller. All questions addressed to me. If I don't know them, I will go ask the seller and I'll get back with you with the answer. But this is just to inspect the home. This is not to address, talk to, ask questions to the seller, period, the end. Do I have your commitment on this, Jerry? Yep, you have my commitment. Awesome. I'll see you Wednesday at five o'clock. Yep, just good communication up front with everybody solves half, more than more than 90% of the problems addressing them up front. 100%. Guys, any questions you have about some of the things that you're doing as you're on the phone? Do you have any struggles, any pain points, any things that you're on the phone or you're out on appointment and you're like, whoa, curveball, don't know how to do this. Please uh, chime in and, and, and type in your questions. Love to uh, answer them while we're here for the next few minutes. Um, but this has been great. I saw a bump in people out here listening. Uh, so I appreciate those that shared this with friends, family, or team members to get them on here. We love helping you guys. I hope this is bringing value. Jerry and I's whole hope behind this is you leave out of here inspired. You leave from this motivated. You leave here empowered that you guys can do this. It's just practicing and always getting better. Always being a student of this. Never, never giving up. Not ever thinking that you know too much. Well, I'm always a student, always a student. And those that are always students will always be the ones that are out there being the movers and shakers and, and, and really turning this business into a successful business. Yeah. Awesome. So uh, I see a question here. Uh, 
a couple up says uh how to make five offers a day you see that one um let's see starker, or yeah starker right here is it journey to sell no no at uh sarker how do you make five offers a day okay and what's the name on it sorry uh mohammed sarker 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 mohammed it's Mo down Ooh. a couple minutes ago up is it uh, you look for it. I'll I'll kind okay, of talk. keep going. So say the question out loud while I look for it, and uh, I'll have you start addressing so, it. So the question is, how do you make five offers a day? So this is someone Cody that um, follows me because one of the things that I talk about is um, if you if you can consistently make five offers a day, uh, that's twenty five a week. That's a hundred a month. My promise is that you will get a deal. You will start to get deals because. You, we have no control over whether or not a seller is going to say yes. What we do have control over is how many quality conversations we have and how, how often we get in front of sellers. We have control over that. And so from then on, it's a numbers game. And my personal belief is if you can put in front of a seller five times a day, an offer five times a day, you will start doing deals. So it's you when you say 100 offers to get one deal, that sounds intimidating. Five a day is not intimidating. You can do it. Even part time, you can do that. And to, to for me, whether it's a verbal or a written, whether it's a real estate agent or a private seller, if you can get to a point where you're having that quality conversation, you're going to get to a you're also going to get to the point where you can make that offer. You can talk price, you can present an offer, and five of those a day is going to start to get you deals. I think a brand. Some just, I don't know this. I, can, I haven't proven this, um, you know, scientifically. But I, I believe, I, I believe with my my whole heart that if you made a hundred offers, you would get at least a deal, a good deal that you can wholesale for ten thousand, fifteen thousand dollars. Out of those hundred, you're going to get that one deal. So, are you willing to do the work? If I said to you, you had to get ninety nine no's to get the one yes, but make ten thousand dollars wholesaling it, would you do it? Most people say yes, but then when when they get to deal, when they get to offer fifty six they burn out and quit and say it's too hard, yeah. right? So I, I just, you just got to break it down and do it consistently every single day. 100%. And again, some of those ones that are no up front are pipeline in the future that you follow up on and turn to deals. So now you're building that compound effect, which is which is crucial. Right. That's why your one to 100 ratio is going to go to two to 100 to three to 100, or you know it's going to improve because you build momentum. It's always harder in the beginning. Your first deal is harder than your 10th deal. Your 10th deal is going to be easier than your first deal and your 100th deal is going to be easier than your 10th deal. And that's momentum. It gets easier as you build a system, as you build a team, as you get better at your processes, better at your, at your ability to talk to sellers. So you just start where you're at and build on it every day. I have two good ones here. So first one is, what's one way to help protect your assignment fee from the cash buyer being annoyed by it? <laughs> one way I'll, I'll tell you, and Jerry, I, I'd love to see what you do is really I addressed this elephant. Look at that, just pulled some hair over. Um, I addressed this elephant and I literally tell people, "Are do, do you get frustrated if wholesalers make a lot of money? And if their initial upfront with me is, yeah, man, I don't think wholesalers should make a lot of money. I don't know if we're gonna be the right fit. I don't know if I would like to add you to the cash buyer list. And I don't know if you'd wanna be added to my cash buyers list because I make a lot of money on each one of my deals. So if that's a huge pressing point for you, I just want to save you the heartburn because I make a lot of money on my deals. So I like, I, I'm always upfront. And if they're like, nope, it has no problem. So if I make 50,000 and you only make 20,000 on a fix and flip, is that going to be a problem? Nope. Awesome. Welcome to the team, bro. Well, I address it. I address it very similar, but a little bit different. What I do is I, I take my assignment fee and I say to the cash buyer, I say, listen, cash buyer, um, before we, before we sign on our assignment, I just want to get something out of the way. I, I, I got to tell you, I'm going to make $32,000 on this assignment. And if it's a problem, tell me right now, because I've got other buyers that are very interested in this property and I don't want to have any issues later. Is this a problem for you? And I'm, I'm actually that direct. I'm that bold and I'm that in their face because I, I want to just nail this one right now and set the precedence that here's how much I'm making and we're not even signing if this is a problem. And every single time I've done that, I, I've never had a, a, a buyer freak out or be. What happens is, is if you avoid it and you delay it and you wait, 
they see it eventually, then they ruminate, then they start to second guess, then they go, you know what, am I overpaying or this isn't fair, Jerry's making more than I'm going to make and I'm doing all the work. Just get all that crap out of the way right up front and just nail it. And then don't do your double closing. I know so many people that double close. <laughs> Why are you double closing? You're double closing because you're afraid to tell the seller how much you're making because you don't think you deserve how much you're making. I don't believe Guys, that. I deserve every penny of it. Put the math on that, okay? Like, here's something I, I want you to listen to what Jerry's saying. If you sold it for 250 but you got it for 200 right? You sell it to the seller or cash buyer for 250 but you put it under contract at $200. you are going to make $50,000, right? Now let's do the scenario. Oh, man, I'm pissed. You're making 50 grand. Now let's call it a new scenario. I actually got the deal that I'm selling you for 250 because that's all I can get out of it. But I put it under contract at 245. It's the same home. It's just my negotiation was really good here and I got it for 200. Yep, that's why I made 50,000 on you. This one, now they're not mad. They're like, ah, I'm okay with you making 5,000. You guys, that's what's really happening. Who cares what you negotiated at? They're buying it because it's a deal to them at, at 250, period, the end. And whether you make 2,000 or whether you make 20,000, it makes no difference. Like that, that's an ego play. Well, he negotiated at 240. I'm fine paying you 10 grand on that. But the moment that I negotiate at 200, he thinks he should be able to tap into my good negotiation skills. No, thanks. Like that's me. That's me working on me on getting better at negotiation. Yeah. So Cody, I've got a deal right now that I'm, I'm buying, um, from, from one of my, one of my students and it's a wholesale. They, they got the deal. It's a co-wholesale. So my student and another wholesaler, I don't know, uh, they're, they're JV and on this deal. Yep. And the, the deal to me is a $50,000 assignment. They have it for 78. I'm paying 128. It's worth 300. Right. So now there was a part of me when I, when I was going through the deal, there was a part of me that in the back of my mind that said, uh, I could probably hit these guys kind of hard. You know, I could probably uh, and uh, get an even better deal. Like I bet you they'd be happy making 30, 40. I'll bet I could kind of push them down on their number. But the thing is, is when they brought it to me at 128, 128 was a deal. I love that deal. I love that number. I was all for it. We're, irregardless of what they made. So then when I found that out, I'm like, good for you. And here's the principle. Count the money in your own pocket, not the money in somebody else's pocket. And as soon as you start counting somebody else's money in their pocket, your mind is all messed up, right? That's not what we do in this business, whether you're on whatever end of the deal you're on. Yeah. You count the money in your own pocket, not somebody else's pocket. So I didn't, I didn't, I didn't beat them up one cent and I'm thrilled that they're making 50 grand. Good for them that they negotiated such a phenomenal deal because I love the price I'm getting it for. Love it. Next one. Say I got a home under contract with a listing agent and my intention is to wholesale. Do I have to provide paperwork with the cash buyer? Does the listing agent take care of it? On something like this, personally, my choice is I'm going to be closing on this before I sell it to my cash buyer. Um, most times that's not going to work if you try to wholesale a on, on market deal. Jerry? Yeah. So this is an area that I excel in. I love uh, wholesaling on market. I do a lot of this and I teach quite a bit about this on my channel. So here's what you guys have to understand. The agent's responsibility is that initial contract between seller and buyer. That's their role. And to see it to closing. That's it. So once you get a contract on market, agents involved, however they're involved, you now have an executed contract. You're the buyer on the contract. You're going to be using their state approved contract because that's what they're going to use to, to do that. Not yours, theirs. Okay. Once you have that in place, agent now set them aside. They're over here now. They're going to get a commission at closing. Seller pays it. They're over here. Now you go find your buyer just like you would off market. You're now going to do the assignment with your cash buyer just like you would off market. Agent has no involvement in any of that because why? Their role was between seller and you on the contract, on the purchase contract. That's it. So now you do your assignment. You go to closing. Agent's not going to know what the heck's going on, <laughs> right? Because they're only interested in the front end of it, not the back end of it. Yep. They might be like, what the heck is going on here? And you say, oh, you know, one of my partners is taking it from here and we're out. Don't worry. You're getting all of the commission that you were originally were getting. Seller's getting their price. Everybody's getting what we agreed on. And so that's just it. You handle it that way. 
You don't got to tell the agent what you're doing. They, you have an equitable interest in that contract. So you can do what you want with it. Assign it, take it down, whatever. Right. So that's all. Don't get confused between the agent now on the transaction and assigning it to a cash buyer. The one thing you have to make sure of is that your assignment is assignable or your contract is assignable that you got to make sure of. So if it's an REO, a short sale, all bank properties have no assignments and some some other contracts might have a no assignment, which means Utah, I, Utah's normal REPSI or real estate purchase contract is not assignable as it stands. You have to add an addendum to make it assignable. So know that, manage that. So then the conversation I'll have with agents is I'll say, look, I don't know quite yet how I want to take this deal down. I don't know if I'm going to close in it in my personal name, my entity. I've got multiple entities. I don't know. Uh, I've got partners I work with. We might close in their entity. I don't know. So what I need to do is I need to have the ability to assign my contract. So when you explain that to an agent, then they're like, oh, I get it. Fine. It's not a problem, right? Just explain to them, just like I said, don't say, I'm going to try to wholesale your this contract for 10 grand more. That's, <laughs> they're, they're going to be upset about that. They're not going to like that, right? So just say, I don't know how I want to close. I need to have the ability to change that. What yeah. do I ask them? What can you do? Oh, we just do a simple addendum or, oh, just add and or signs on your name and that's fine. Whatever it is, <laughs> it's a little bit differently, but just make sure you have the ability to assign it and then you're back to normal real estate, back to normal wholesaling. Ooh, a good one. I don't do virtual guys. So this is going to be Jerry's wheelhouse. How can you make lately sellers are saying this to Tashiana. Um, how can you make a legitimate offer and you don't even live in this state? Not only do I not live in the state, but I'm making an offer and I haven't even seen the property. So let's take it a step further. You don't live in the state. And how are you right now making me an offer? you know, Jerry Norton investor cash offer when you haven't even seen it, right? Legit question. Oh, totally legit question. And the answer is super easy. It's listen, we buy a lot of properties. We have a business model. We work with lots of partners and investors, and we're not really concerned about all of those things. If, if the deal fits for our criteria, for what we're looking for to buy a house in your neighborhood, we'll buy it. We'll pay cash. I've got the, I've got investors and partners that can do this. And it's not an issue. It's not a concern. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Address it. Or sometimes I like to see if it's, if it's on their end that they're not motivated. So maybe we're talking to the wrong person that wasn't even looking to sell. And so that's their way of saying, how can you make a legitimate offer if you don't even live in the state? Then I'll literally say, usually when I hear something like that, not all the time, but usually those people are not really looking to sell their home. Is this the case? And put it back on them. Or, so, I mean, really what it, so every time a seller asks a question, it's because there's a concern. Yeah. But what is the concern here? I mean, if I were to ask, if I were, Tashiana, if I were to ask you, what do you think their concern is? Their concern is probably that you're not going to perform, that you're not, that you're not a real buyer, that you're going to string them along and they're going to get to closing. And then you're not going to, you're going to be out of the picture somewhere. What is their concern? Address it and reassure them. That's, that's all, whatever their question is, you, you're going to come up. There's no way you could possibly anticipate everything someone's going to ask. What you can anticipate or try to find out is what is the concern? So a better way to solve, to, to resolve that would be, help me understand what your concern is. Cause I buy a lot of properties out of state that I've never even seen. So, so help me understand what is your concern with that and see if you can uncover their concern. Okay. I'm looking for some good ones. Here we go. You may have something like that. Do you have a template when presenting an offer? <clears throat> uh, I mean, definitely. There's only there's only a handful of things that every offer has to cover, right? You got to have price, got to have an address, got to have a seller, right? You got to have a closing date. Um, and so there's just a handful of things. So once you're comfortable with putting an offer together, once you've done it a dozen times, 20 times, 30 times, it's like, boom, second nature. Because it's it's everything else stays the same, other than just these these key things that need updated with every with every contract, right? So that's a repetition thing. Um, my my contracts, my off market private contracts, uh, it's just it's just fill in the blank, right? Boom, send it over through digital for digital signature. So you go through those handful of things that you need to have, and we're not we're not rewriting every offer. It's all it's pretty much ninety nine percent ready. Yeah, those couple of things. 100% true. 
Are you making offers on any and all properties that you see? Or do you focus on specific property, uh, property types? Yes, specific. So going back to the beginning, we're looking for motivation. Motivation can be a distressed seller or a distressed situation. And that's what we're looking for. So those are the easiest list. And you can already start to find lists that promote the distressed either situation or the distressed home, like code violation. That means the grass could be tall or boarded up windows. That shows a sign of distress on the property. Tax delinquent could show distress on the seller or behind on their mortgage could show distress on the seller. And so, yes, we're, we're, we're working first and foremost, if, I, if I'm spending marketing dollars, I'm just getting in the game. I'm going to work on the motivation side that I know there's some motivation and then I'll go figure out and find out if they have equity versus working on the equity side and trying to find out if they have motivation. Yeah, I love that. So two, two big things to think about, James, is uh, Cody mentioned this, but think about distress. Now, for me, distress can fall into two ways, either the seller's financially distressed or the property's distressed. The, and equity, I guess. If there's no equity, then that kind of kills the whole thing right out of the gate. So those are kind of the qualifiers. I, and I think that's the question you're asking. Now, if you're asking, well, what about, you know, multifamily? What about mobile homes? What about condos? What about this? What about that vacant land? Um, whatever type of property that you're interested in wholesaling or flipping, it just comes back to, do you understand that, that type of property? Do you understand the market? Do you understand who your buyer is? If you can understand that, then you can wholesale it. And I don't care what it is. It could be a car wash. Yeah. But if you understand the car wash model, you can wholesale it. Okay, so that's exciting. You just gotta make, that's why single family, residential single family is so easy because there's a massive buyer on the retail side. So you can take a deal like that to buy and hold people, fix and flippers, uh, live in flippers, even directly to retail themselves and you've got a massive buyer, you start getting into specialized stuff, it gets harder because your pool of buyers shrinks. But if you understand that buyer, you can wholesale it. Love it. I love how one of our listeners is saying, Colby, I know, I love how people in the chat are also helping each other with their questions. Love seeing people help others exceed, <clears throat> succeed. He had a question up above, and I don't see this being a silly question, Colby. I think it's good. So cash buyer can be, yeah, someone that physically has cash in the bank, in the hand, ready to go to close on it. Or it can be a hard cash loan from a lender. But yeah, you're not going through like your 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 Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac loans that you're having to qualify under their stipulations. These are people that know you're buying it as is. And in most cases, aren't lendable, livable homes. They're as is conditions where Freddie Mae and Fran or Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac aren't going to lend on those homes. So cash buyer could be yes, their own cash or just someone that's willing to say, Hey, yeah, I'll put my, I'll put my money out in your hand so you can go close on that. And in turn, you're going to pay me for that money that I lend you. Yeah. Awesome. Hey, uh, I got to go to a piano recital in okay. like two minutes. Okay. <laughs> Literally guys, one or two more questions. Um, let's see. We got some love the info. Got this. Um, hey, man, brother. Um, let's see. We got facts. I think we just end with this. End with uh, straightforward. How do we close this off? Maybe some housekeeping on the chat. And uh, let's go from there, Jer. Yeah, so awesome. Well, guys, we've gone a good hour and a half straight here. This was really fun, Cody. I love that we had enough time to really go through. Like We covered a lot of the elements of putting together that offer and presenting with a seller in person and also on the phone. So that was really fun to be able to kind of break that down and, and then still get to some Q and A. So guys, I'd love to hear feedback. Cody would too. Do you really like when we bring on a guest and we do the anatomy of a deal and kind of break down their deal and you get to see a perspective from someone that's out there in the trenches like you, you know, doing the business and then, and then making some time for some Q and A or do you prefer, we really hammer down on a topic and then do Q and A, or do you like both? And maybe we mix it up a little bit. Please, please share that with us. That's really important feedback. We want to make sure that this is, is the highest content value. Our goal is that there's no other live stream show that you, that you go to that you can't, that you cannot miss this because it's so good. That's our goal. Yeah. Uh, we'll continue to bring that fire for you guys. Um, but when we end right now, just so you guys know, the, the chat will stop, but the comment section below will, will continue on. Uh, so if you, if you still have questions or you want to participate or you watch this after the live, 
then leave a comment. We'll try our best to answer those questions too. Um, and then Cody and I are going to continue to try to do this. So set this aside in your weekly schedule, like get here for these things. Um, we're, we don't hold anything back. We're going to give it all as much as we possibly can to you. And well, the one thing Cody says every single time is take these notes. Even if you just pick the one thing and you do that one thing, do something, take action from what you've learned today, apply it right away so that you can start to see the results from, from these things that you're learning. Um, I think that's probably it, Cody. Love it. Guys, go out there and fail your way forward and take massive, imperfect action. That's the crucial thing. Guys, love you guys. Appreciate you guys. Go out there and make a difference. Go serve people. Don't make it about real estate. Make it about solving problems, loving people, serving people. And you'll realize that um, at the end of the day, the byproduct is you get a home under contract at a deep discount that you can go out and make a lot of money on. So, Thank you guys. Hope this has been a blessing to you guys. Go out there and go do good.